Let me rephrase that now. Okay. We have been uh, uh, the last several Sundays talking about the general topic of whether or not man is religious by nature. And so for the benefit of those of you who may be here for the first time, let me just give you kind of a recap of, of the point. Many, many people, and you probably know someone like this who says, well, I'm not a religious person. And yet, all the evidence shows just to the contrary. And the point of what we're looking at and are continuing it today and will be for the next few weeks is the fact that man is indeed religious by nature. And the evidence is all around us. For example, there are over 30,000 different religions. And if man is not religious, then why do they exist? God didn't create them all. You know, and you have all of the different uh, religious connotations and even people when, when people swear and uh, use vulgarity, oftentimes they'll refer to God. Yeah. Now, how can an atheist or a secularist who doesn't believe in God all of a sudden come along and ask God to do something bad to something? Because that's basically what they're saying. And so the point is very simple, that we are religious by nature, but the question then comes as to why are we religious by nature? Why is it that there's something inside every one of us that is crying out for God. Now, in our understanding of who that God is or what kind of God it may be, varies, and, it, and all of that sort of thing, but the fact still remains that there is something inside us that cries out for God. The answer is very simple. And we're going to really look at that next week as we continue this series. The reason that we are, that man is religious by nature is because we were created for God. When you look at all of the creation, you study the creation account out of the first three chapters in Genesis, and you'll discover among many, many different things something very incredibly profound, and that is when it came to the fact of God creating man, the terminology that's used and the means by which man is created is totally different from anything else. God created man to have an intimate personal relationship with him. Not just to believe in him intellectually, not just to do good things in order to impress him, but to have a personal relationship with him. Now, today we're looking at an area that's a little bit different, and I use that, I asked Terry to share that passage of Scripture for a reason. And that is because it describes the fact there are several phrases and statements made in that passage of Scripture that are important for us to understand. First of all, uh, is after Paul talks about, in the beginning of verse 16, going on for several verses, uh, he says this, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes. And so Paul is very, very clear in, in dealing with that. And we will not take time to get into that. Maybe at another time we'll kind of dissect that passage of Scripture. But the, the first thing that we see, though, is in verses 18 through 20, and that is the fact, the number one, that man knows that God's real. Deep down inside, instinctively, he knows God's real. Now, he can deny it, he can say God doesn't exist, or he can say all kinds of things he wants to, but instinctively, something inside of him says this thing is, is, a, is a legitimate thing. God is real. The second thing that we see, is, and this is in verse 21, is the fact that man willfully refuses to recognize God. Man, for whatever reason, man refuses to say God is, God, God is real. He just simply says, I don't believe you. He denies it his existence. But just because you deny something exists doesn't mean it no longer exists, does it? I mean, you can say, I do not believe in the, uh, in, in the law of gravity. But let me suggest, if you want to prove that, that the law of gravity doesn't exist, climb up on the roof here and step off and tell me what happens. Just because you don't believe something doesn't mean it's not true. Or doesn't mean it's that it's not true. You see. And so just because somebody comes along and says, you know, I don't believe in God, that doesn't change a thing. Now think about that. It doesn't change a thing. God still is there. He still exists. He's still real. And then in beginning in verse 24, Paul goes on and he starts describing the many, many different ways in which because man refuses to acknowledge God, man no longer has a standard by which to live, and so he begins to live his life the way he wants to. And it goes from one extreme to the other in the way that that plays itself out, and Paul describes that. He talks about the fact that children will be disobedient to parents and this, that, and the other. Why is that true? Because when you deny 
that God is real, then you have no basis to recognize the legitimacy of God's Word. If God doesn't exist, then God's Word doesn't exist. It's just a collection of writings, you see. And when you remove that, then you remove all standard of morality and, and ethical conduct for, conduct for a person to live his life. So when there's no standard by which to measure your life, then you can live as the Bible describes and do that which is pleasing in your own sight. Everything is relative. Doesn't it sound like something familiar to our culture today of what we're seeing and what Paul described? And this was almost 2,000 years ago when Paul wrote this. Now the interesting thing about it is that there was a similar passage of Scripture clear back in the book of Joshua almost 2,000 years before Paul wrote his letter to, to the Roman believers. Joshua spoke to the children of Israel as they were getting ready to leave the, the wilderness after wandering around for 40 years. God had taken them out of Egypt, out of the bondage that they experienced there for 400 years and had led them through the wilderness and they were getting ready to go into the promised land and Joshua makes these comments and I just want to read some of this to you. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've forgotten that word, where that verse is. Anyway, I'll get to it in just a second here. Hang on. I look at, I'm looking at the wrong, uh, the wrong sheet. Joshua 24, verse, first uh, for 15 verses. Anyway, Joshua, he re rehearses everything that God has done for them. And he starts out by saying, uh, he says, From ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, and they, what? Served other gods. So, immediately, this is written over 4,000 years ago, so immediately we understand that 4,000 years ago man was a religious being. And there were many, many religions that existed. And so he goes on then, and he's, talk, of course, talking about the river Euphrates. He's talking about the ancient Mesopotamian valley. He's talking about what is now modern-day Iraq, the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And he says, from ancient times, your father lived, and, and while they were there, they served other gods. And then he just starts rehearsing the history, and he says, and in verse 3, so I took your father Abraham from beyond that river, and I took him to all to the land of Canaan, and gave him and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac and, and then Jacob and Esau and so forth and so on. And then he refers or he alludes to the fact that even there, all the Canaanites, they were worshiping other gods as well. And that was hundreds of years later. And then after that, he comes down in verse 5 and he says, Then I sent Moses and Aaron and I plagued Egypt. Well, Egypt was, was filled with pagan gods. In fact, each of the ten plagues that God laid on Egypt, they were plagues that were directed toward one of the pagan gods that Egypt, the Egyptian people worshipped. And God just continued to lay that out. And then he, so he brings them all the way up. And he, after he rehearses this, then he finishes up and he says in verse 15, verse 14, Now therefore, after all this history, in other words, folks, you know the history of your people. You know that your people have been in, inundated time and time and time again with all kinds of religious practices, none of which have satisfied the heart. So, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And then this famous scripture, Joshua 24, 15. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you were living. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. So this raises the question. Now, if you're interested, when you leave, uh, there's a little note sheet where you can gain, get some helpful information on some of the things that I'll be sharing with you this morning. But let's talk about this whole idea of religions. There are many. As I said earlier, we know of at least 30,000 different religions that exist in around the world. So how do you deal with this? How, when you're going to talk to somebody about their relationship to God, how are you going to talk to them? How are you going? Which God are you going to talk about? 
say. You going to talk about Ashtoreth? Or Moloch? Or one of the other gods? So, just to help you clarify in our minds, all religions can be categorized in one of three categories. There are three different types of religions. There are religions that have many gods. God's religions like animism, pantheism, so forth. They believe that there are many gods, and you sort of pick and choose the god that you want to worship, or you perhaps, like in Abraham's day, before he left the, the land that he did, that his family was involved. In fact, tradition says that Abraham's family was actually involved in, built, in, in constructing idols for people to purchase to put in their homes. And they were made out of clay and out of wood, and people would purchase those idols and would place them in certain places in their homes and they would go around and they worship those gods. In fact, the whole Tower of Babel, which we'll talk about at a later time in a few weeks, was the center of pagan worship uh, and the worship of many gods. And after all of these different gods, if you read that passage of scripture in the 11th chapter of Genesis, it's really kind of fascinating because it says this. Uh, they said, we're gonna build a tower that will reach heaven. So in spite of the fact they had had all these gods that they had concocted, there was still an empty spot. It's very much like the first message I preached a couple weeks ago on this subject and when Paul was in, in, on the Acropolis in, in Athens and chapter 17 in the book of Acts and he says, I see that you have all these gods and I, I conclude you're a very religious person. You're very religious people. In fact, you even have one to the unknown God just in case you miss one. And he said, uh, just for your information, that's the one I'm going to tell you about. And then he began to talk about the person of Jesus Christ. So you have religions that have many gods. But then you also have religions that are, have worship, they worship one God. And those, there are three primary religions that worship one God. They're called monotheistic, one God. Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. That's it. Now there may be some others out there that I don't know about, but as far as I know, that's the only, the only three religions that worship one God. And then you have the third group of religious people that worship no God. You see, how can you be religious and not worship God? Well, that's a good question, but people do it all the time. Atheism, agnosticism, secularism, humanism, the New Age movement, all of those aspects are religious. In fact, the New, the, the new Age movement and the atheist the, uh, movement that both of those items have in their charter of incorporation, the fact that they are religion. So a person who is not a religious person practices religion. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? But that's the way people may, are, and that's the, the nature of human nature. So you have three different kinds of religions. Now the second thing, that we, the, the next thing we look at then is, let's focus in on the religions that worship only one God. And of course those are uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now, Joanne and I began to develop this type of material when we were missionaries in Ukraine because we were working with a lot of people that had uh, either no religious beliefs or they had one that was very, very skewed and was very confused. And so we began to develop this to teach it in the Bible studies that we conducted after our English classes were held on a Tuesday night. We had about 125 to 150 people that came every Tuesday night to, to learn English. And it was, in, it was a graded system, five different levels. But following that, we had an optional Bible study that was available both in Russian and in English where people who wanted to study the Bible and wanted to practice their English more by getting into conversation, we could stand and share with them. And I had the privilege, uh, after the first year that I was there, uh, I began to teach the, the older group, the more advanced group. And we would have between 40 and 60 people every Tuesday evening that would stay after, Bible st after the English classes to study the Bible. And the amazing thing was that more than 80% of them were not believers. Just a small handful that had a personal relationship with God. Many of them were religious, but the majority of them were either atheists 
or they were secularists, or they were from the Orthodox Church that is filled with all kinds of pagan ritualism and, and, and uh, a, sync a syncretism of uh, Christianity and other philosophies. So we began to share with them and teach them some of the things that I'm even sharing with you. And that was the reason that I broke it down the way it is so that people could understand uh, exactly what they were getting into when they start talking about religion and start talking about God. Now, rather than take time, though, to deal and to contrast all the different religions, what we would instead do is we would focus on the person of Jesus Christ and we would compare him to the other religions. Let me just share some things, and this is some of the material that you can pick up if you want it. On the subject of God himself, all other religions believe that God is distant, unreachable, and uninvolved in man's affairs. Christianity, on the other hand, says that God is a triune, sovereign God that can be known personally, and He is accessible. When it comes to the issue of sin, other religions believe that there either is no such thing, or that if there is sin, you're personally responsible to deal with it through self-improvement, some form of self-improvement. The Bible teaches us that sin is real, that it separates us from God, and that man is guilty and condemned, and it has a penalty that has to be paid by somebody. Then the subject of salvation, for example. Salvation to the, uh, in the other religions is either unnecessary or it's obtained by some kind of works and efforts in order to get it. True Christianity, on the other hand, says that salvation is a gift. It comes only through Christ, and as we can, there's nothing that we can do to achieve it. We have to simply receive it as a gift of a God who loves us with an unconditional love. Now, when you start going through all of these things, for example, what is it that motivates a person? What is the thing that motivates you if you have to be part of another religion? You're going to be motivated by fear. Because basically you're going to have a desire to appease and satisfy whatever God it is that you're worshiping because you want to avoid the punishment He's going to give you. Christianity, on the other hand, the motivation is love. God's desire to rescue, redeem, and reconcile His Christ's creation back to Himself. See? So we could go through all of these different subjects. We could talk about who is it that initiates it. Well, in the other religions of the world, the person that initiates the religious experience is man. Stone idols don't initiate anything. Wooden idols don't initiate anything. Philosophies don't initiate anything. But in Christianity, it's God, through the person of the Holy Spirit, that initiates it. And by His very nature, and the fact that He has created us and He loves us, He initiates the love experience and the love effort to draw us back to who He is. You see? See, you can't, <laughs> there's, you don't have anything to offer God that would make Him want to accept you. I mean, just kind of settle that in your mind right now. There's nothing within any of us that is that way. Well, how about the person of Jesus Christ? Other religions either don't, deny He doesn't exist or He's nothing more than a good teacher or a prophet. And He may be one of several predecessors that lead to other gods. Christianity, of course, believes that he, has, he is God in the flesh, that He's our Savior, He's our Redeemer, He's the sacrifice, He's the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the world for our sins. And we can go on and on and on through all this. But you understand what I'm trying to say. And this morning, as we sort of come to a conclusion at this point, uh, I'll leave it up to you. If you want one of the little sheets, you can pick them up and uh, look at them. Uh, and hopefully it will be a benefit to you, but the one thing we have to walk away from today is this. We were created for God. No other reason will satisfy the inner longing that we have. To know that God created us. The Bible says it was in Him that we live, we move, and we exist. Paul talked about this in chapter 17 verse, uh, of Acts, verse 23. We were created to live in a personal relationship with God. And no kind of, of religious activity or, or garb will satisfy that because it's not something that takes place on the outside. It's, not so, it's something that happens within us. 
because we were created for Him. And the reason we were created for Him is so He can love us. And because He loves us, He has expressed His love for us through the sacrifice of His Son. So that Jesus Christ would die, and I mentioned this earlier, He died a death that He didn't deserve for sins that He didn't commit so that you and I could have a relationship that we could have with no other, in, a, in no other way. And so we come back then to one of the things that the Apostle John said in John chapter 1. He starts out by saying, In the beginning was the Word, talking about Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was with God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And then he goes on and he says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We saw Him. We beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And in 1 John 1.12 it says, And as many as received Him, received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name. So you see, it's not enough to acknowledge that I'm religious. And it's not enough to even acknowledge that I believe in Jesus Christ and that I believe in Christianity. It requires on my part a conscious choice. As many as receive Him, He gave the right to become the children of God. Next week, we'll follow up on this with an exciting story of how this whole thing fits together from the beginning of Genesis. In Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make him after our likeness. And let him have dominion over all I've created. It's profound truth. And this is, this is what I would call the stack pole of the message of the gospel of Jesus. But in the meantime, you can study and examine all the different religions you want to. That's up to you. But the final moment comes somewhere down the line where you have to make a choice and say, am I willing to accept Jesus Christ as the one and only? Jesus God, Jesus himself told this rich guy, this great educator, Nicodemus, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. That whoever believes, the word for believe there is a word that means to roll over on, to put your faith and trust in. Whoever believes in him will never perish, but you'll have everlasting life. The connection, the broken connection between God and man is restored in the person of Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word.